Hello and welcome, I'm the Restless Kaiser and we are modeling for advantage. Time recording, we're about a month out from the release of Clash of Steel. We haven't been sent a review copy yet, we're hoping to get one from the guys over at Battlefront, so if you've seen this, please do send us a copy. So I thought it was worth, there's been quite a few different sources of information, condensing some of that together and seeing what I think about the thing so far. Um, you'll see me looking over to the right occasion, you've got the computer here. So I've taken the stills from places like uh, the Gale Force 9 website for Clash of Steel, uh, the information that Pete Siminovich gave us at Christmas in his sort of State of the Union address that he does every year. Um, but also, we were sent a trade catalogue, so with that came quite a lot of information about what is coming out with this release and the release schedule. So let's go and have a look. You can see from the list here, which is the information we've been sent as customers of Battlefront, we have a trade account with them, this is the, um, it's got the, the dates of the releases in there, and the, num the products in the range. And there's quite a lot of new stuff there. Some stuff we've already got in uh, Flames of War and Team Yankee, other stuff is brand new. So according to the information that we have on the 13th of April is when the first Clash of Seals starter set is gonna release, which is the USA versus the Soviets. This is their post-war, immediate post-war setting. So let's have a little bit of a look at what's supposed to be coming in that set. This is set to retail at £60. There's 21 vehicles in them. Most of them are pretty big. This is one of the two star sets that they're doing. £60 for 20 tanks seems pretty decent. Um, you can see in the, in the foreground there, there's the newer vehicles, which is the IS-3 and so forth. And further back, we've got things like uh, Jackson's um, ISUs and so forth. 21 vehicles though, nice. And for existing players, you'll be able to use a lot of your existing late war collection and port that in. So what's that working out? 21 tanks, 60 pound, about 30 pe three pound a tank. That's pretty good value for money. And then the following month on the 11th of May is the German and British set. So again, new vehicles here and some old ones. So we've got on the German side, the mouse, we've got some King Tigers, We've got some Tigers and we've got some Panzer IV L70s. The British side, we've got a couple of the newer vehicles and some, are they Challengers at the back there? They're the kind of um, Cromwell hull with the 17 pounder, I think. I forget which of the tanks that is. There's 17 tanks in here and I think that's because the German ones are very big kits. So again, some of this stuff is usable from late war and some of the stuff you already have, you can pour into here. So drilling down into a bit more detail, you see some of the components. Um, this is from the Gale Force 9 website, showing you a bit of a, a breakdown of some of the things that you're gonna get in that Clash of Seal starter set. You're obviously getting the tanks that we've talked about, but you can see the unit cards down the bottom. And this is quite interesting because it gives us a bit of an indication of gameplay. These unit cards will look extremely familiar to anyone who plays Team Yankee or Flames of War. They have essentially the same layout of stats. The actual format of the of the of the card, the, the and the layout of it is a little bit different, but the values, the numbers that are being used are fundamentally the same. Right down to that, we've got our four different movement types on our cross number, our weapon types, our range, etc. Our special rules are presented a little bit differently, and we're not seeing the back of the cards. But again, we've got words like on the Tortoise has got protective ammo, the T28 has got the assault gun rule. So I can't guarantee at this stage that those are exactly the same, but you can see that on one level, this is very similar to Flames of War and Team Yankee, which is good because as a tank on tank game, I think Flames of War is very good. I think it's got the right amount of granularity that means a Panzer IV and a Sherman V are different rather than in so many games they would just come out as being the same. But the game isn't slow because of it. The way that their armor and penetration works, they've got the numbers, I think, in a good place. So I don't feel that they need to change that. But from the how to play section on the Gale Force 9 website, you can see this explanation. So again, this looks very familiar to the, to the newer way that they've been presenting the rules. But you can also see that they seem to be the same rules, which again, is explaining here how the cross checks works and tactical moves and so forth. Again, 
all very good, all very familiar. For, so for existing people within the franchise, you should be able to pick up and play this game quite quickly and quite easily. And again, looking at their armor penetration rule illustration, you can see there, it works, works in the same way. Where the game is quite different though, and I'm, this is the bit I'm most excited about, is if you look at this, it seems to have procedurally generated missions. Now, Flames of War has got its mission format, which many of us are very familiar with, and there's a great series of missions, the, the, the core ones, and you have that kind of choice about whether you're attacking and defending and so forth to work out you, which mission you're going to play and I think that that's all an interesting way to play and very good for tournaments and so forth um, but this proprietary or procedurally generated missions from a series of cards with a series of extra effects so we've got um, mission map 3 here mission rules 4 mission map 3 is pretty straightforward you can you can easily see how to use that you'll see we've got very different objective marker locations as in flames of war they're very much like just inside your table edge generally and what that means in a normal flames of war game is you usually have to basically win the battle to claim the objectives it's very rare you can snag an objective cheekily um, because of how it works but with this objectives more often in more forward locations or even on the center line like they are here that means there's much more to play for and it requires a much more aggressive fast-paced and destructive type of game if you're kind of beer and pretzels type of game with tanks i think that's really good i like objectives in the middle of the table i like things that encourage aggressive play because i like that as a gaming experience i always feel if i kind of line up my stuff on my edge of the board and just shoot until turn six and win i didn't make a decision but if i've got to fight for the middle of the board and so have you. There's so much more involved. You have to learn how to attack to win the game. And I think that that's really important. So again, here we got mission rules number four. So whether I think these are going to be cards, but there might be tables as well in the rule book. Not sure. Um, and that says scattered immediate reserves. Now, people of Flames of War will recognize that. Um, but this is just a different way of generating them. So you've got a map, you choose a map, you choose a set of mission rules. Many of them will be familiar. Hopefully there's some new ones that mix it up. But we've also got this other wild card here, which is fuel dump. At the end of the game, the player holds the, this objective has three additional victory points. Now it's not telling us which of those markers is a fuel dump, I don't think. So maybe that's an extra one. Again, we'd need the, the full rules to see it. I think in a lot of more modern games that feel much more dynamic, you have things that mix up the basic play whether you draw these cards during the game or before nonetheless they change a familiar and some might say eventually quite tired formats and they keep them fresh you can play on the same map one of the games that I have really enjoyed but always struggled to get other people to play is Games Workshop's Warcry and what I loved about it was the procedurally generated missions and and with that came the deployment, the objective, all of it. You didn't know what you were going to be doing until the game started. And what that meant was meta list building didn't really work. You had to work with what you've got in the environment with a mission that was going to be unknown. It seems like this game is going to have some elements of that and I think that's fantastic. And then the last card we've got here is this good optics card. So again, exactly where these fit in, we don't quite know yet but it looks like you can get by upgrades or somehow acquire upgrades to your vehicles so adding eight inches to the range is the range of a tank's weapon until the end of the turn could be quite significant now in truth most late war vehicles are going to have pretty long ranges because the gun size has got so big and these are not just late war these are post-war it might be situationally good but if this is a once a game thing, that could be quite decisive, particularly when you're looking at the end of the game, maybe only having two or three tanks left scattered across three objectives. That extra eight inches could be clutch at some situation. I'm sure there's a whole bunch more of these. Uh, and that does say like you own the shooting step and there says presumably that's when you play it. Sorry, I'm pointing, you can't see. That's where it is on my screen. That's presumably the stage of the game that you play that. How many of these cards? We don't know yet, but hopefully there's a healthy number of these and they're going to keep things fresh and they keep things from your opponent. 
the certainty of knowing how a turn can play out because fixed ranges is one of the things I don't like about a lot of war games because an experienced player within a system can really leverage that, exam that advantage. Whereas things that mix that up, they really mess with that kind of metagaming approach to it. And I think they're really good. I've said things like really good quite a lot of times now because I think at its heart, I really enjoy Flames of War and I think I like Team Yankee more. Um, I'm much more invested in the Flames of War as a, as a, a, you know, someone who loves military history. I'm much more interested in that era, particularly Northwest Europe, 1944, where a lot of our games are played. But as a game, I like Team Yankee more, even though I'm less interested in the, in the history, because what happens in Team Yankee is all of the guns have got bigger, the firepower numbers have gone up, the lethality of the game has increased, and it's much faster. Um, I also think Flames of War is at its very best in its vehicular combat. I'm not suggesting that its infantry rules are bad. I think infantry, they change the pace of the game, and that's what infantry should do. But if you want a beer and pretzels game and you take the infantry out, and just drive tanks around like wild men. I'm very positive about this. The procedurally generated missions, the fact that it's tanks only, and the fact that I can use a lot of my existing collection, which is already painted and ready to go. Really excited about it. The starter set price of £60 looks great. It's going to pad out my 1945 forces, which are quite weak but I can use my 44, 45 stuff that I already have into this. What's not to like? Really positive. And again, Battlefront, if you're watching, send us a review copy as soon as they're available and I'll be delighted. Hope this video was useful for you guys. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye. If you're enjoying our Flames of War content and considering getting one of the starter sets or starter armies, why don't you think about buying one from our online web store at modelingforadvantage.co.uk? Thank you.